Um, so welcome, this is the Fire Documents tutorial. Uh, again, hopefully you're in the, the right room. Um, so I'm uh, uh, Rick Geimer. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of HL7 Structure Documents Working Group, an active member of the Fire Infrastructure Work, uh, work Group as well. Uh, Co-editor of Consolidated CDA and many other implementation guides. Currently I'm leading the uh, CCDA on Fire project. And my day job is the Chief Innovation Officer at Lantern Consulting Group. Um, basically, we're a, a healthcare services company, uh, yada, 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 all that stuff. Um, so what we're going to do uh, today uh, in this tutorial, we're going to go over an overview of clinical documents in general. Um, then we're going to talk about FHIR documents in particular. Uh, we'll dive into details on the composition resource, which is sort of the the, the glue that binds together FHIR documents, or um, uh, the, uh, and then dump, uh, bundles, which is how you wrap them all up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the operations that you can do on documents and how you might move them around, how you might manage them, how you might store them. And uh, actually, that uh, outline there went a little bit too far because that starts getting into tomorrow's presentation. So just boom. And save. All right. And let's see if I can get this thing working today. There we go. All right. Um, so basically, uh, you know, if you're wondering what clinical documents are, they can look like this. They can uh, be in old EHRs. Um, they can be on old style cell phones and PDAs if you want. They can be uh, things like diagnostic imaging reports out of DICOM systems. They can be on your iPhone. In other words, clinical documents are all over the place in, in healthcare. Um, <coughs> Basically, when you're trying to identify clinical documents and how they might be different from things like messages, uh, you want to look at the key characteristics of documents. And these are defined um, in HL7's uh, clinical document architecture spec and also repeated in the um, uh, fire spec in our clinical document profile. Um, basically, some of the key ones are that documents are persistent. They're not uh, transient things like, uh, like many messages where you send them from system to system and then throw away. Um, clinical documents are meant to be stored and often have a legal retention, uh, re uh, retention period, something like seven years. Um, again, just think about uh, anything that goes in the patient chart in the paper world that carries a clinician's signature, signature on it. You don't just throw those away after the counter's done. You keep them around and they often get referred to over and over again. Clinical documents, just because they become electronic, that requirement doesn't go away. Uh, sort of dovetailing with that is the concept of stewardship. If these things are going to be persisted, there needs to be an organization who is going to persist them, who's going to keep the record. And that's called the steward or custodian of a document. Uh, next is the potential for authentication. Uh, clinical documents are typically meant to be signed. There are things that clinicians, uh, you know, again, for a paper document, they put a wet signature on it. In the uh, electronic world, you would still capture the name of the clinician who is signing this or who is authenticating or attesting to the information. Next is the context. Uh, um, the clinical document uh, sort of establishes a default context for all its content. And that's really what the composition resource does. It says who the patient is, who the author of the document is, when it was created, all this kind of information that uh, is important for you know, locating documents and understanding just you know, the content within them. Next is wholeness. Clinical documents tell a whole story. Um, they're not just a discrete data element. It's not just a single resource, like a single condition. There are often things like a history and physical or a discharge summary that contain you know, either a whole record of an encounter or perhaps uh, um, a record of the patient's care over a long period of time. Or it could be something uh, like a procedure note or an operative note that just talks about one uh, service that was performed. Um, but they do tell a whole story. So again, they're not just single discrete data elements. And lastly, um, the one that I, uh, probably uh, um, one of the more important ones is human readability. Clinical documents are meant to be read by people also processed by machines, but you should be able to take any clinical document, bring it up on a web browser, and be able to read it. Um, uh, with, uh, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're, they're pretty, but they should be readable. Um, so why are documents important? Um, first of all, they, they really represent the dual nature of the clinical record. Um, you know, I've heard quotes around, and this applies to just about every industry that you, that you go to, um, that there's you know, always this mix of data and narrative, and the actual part that's data that's highly structured, put in databases and stuff like that, is probably only about 20% of the actual record. That other 80% is usually narrative, okay? It's, it's, it's human readable text. 
that is not necessarily backed up by all this computable data. So documents uh, support that duality. They allow you to, to mix data and narrative together. Um, you can have documents that are fully generated from data where all the, the narrative is completely in sync. And you can have documents that are fully narrative and have no uh, uh, coded data backing it up or any mix in between. Uh, so really, whatever your use case is, um, you can support that. Um, again, as software developers, you probably want that data, I mean, because that's what is going to drive your applications. But clinicians often say that the most important part is the narrative. It's the, the words that their colleagues down the hall or you know, across town actually wrote about the state of the patient. Uh, so just be aware of that and, and, and you know, consider that balance when you're building applications. So um, into FHIR documents. Uh, so when FHIR uh, DST1 came out, there was a sort of fledgling framework for creating FHIR documents in there. And um, you know, uh, myself, Graham Grieve, a couple other folks sort of took a look at it and discussed it and um, you know, decided we actually needed to write a sort of position statement on how FHIR documents should work and, um, and what we need to do going forward. Um, this uh, paper uh, basically um, made a position statement that FHIR is the future for clinical documents. This is where we want to be. Um, and it also proposed a call to action because when we first wrote this in 2014, we realized very quickly that FHIR wasn't quite ready to handle clinical documents, at least the way they've been done in uh, CDA. Um, <clears throat> so we, we basically wanted to define and promote a future where clinical documents and APIs share a common syntax and set of uh, resources and establish a technical and regulatory policy and a smooth roadmap for clinical document exchange using FHIR. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so after this, we went ahead and started working uh, through um, the FHIR document framework. We got to DSTU2, tightened up the composition resource, we got real bundles and got away from the atom feeds and such, and uh, started you know, just making sure we could cover all the use cases uh, for clinical documents that we could in the old you know, uh, CDA specification. And uh, right now, the clinical document framework in, in FHIR is, is pretty darn robust, uh, happy to say. Um, <clears throat> so it can address the uh, CDA use case for clinical documents. And the way we do this is uh, by collecting uh, a bunch of resources together, starting with the composition resource. Okay, it's much like a, um, if you folks have worked with CDA before, it's much like the CDA header plus uh, narrative. And actually, let me just get a show of hands. How many folks are familiar with uh, clinical document architecture, CDA or CCDA? About a third of you, okay. For those of you who aren't, um, be glad you're starting with FHIR. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, basically, when you uh, create a fire document, again, you start with a composition resource, and that'll tell you, it'll set that context, it'll tell you who the, the patient is, what kind of document it is, what the title is, what its date was, all that sort of metadata information that helps you locate the documents you want to find. Um, and then uh, you can also put in additional coded resources like you know, allergy intolerance, condition, um, uh, medication statements, all that type of stuff in there as well. And then you bundle it all together. Um, you might wonder why you do that. Um, it's mainly so that you can, first of all, sign the whole thing. You can treat these as immutable objects. And uh, the most important one, in my opinion, is that um, clinical documents often outlive the systems on which they're created. All right? You know, I talked about a legal retention period of seven years. How many fire servers have been around for seven years? Mm -hmm. How many fire servers have been around for six months and then were discontinued? Or had all the data erased or something like that? A lot more. Um, so you need to be able to take these things off of a server and persist them somewhere and be able to move them around uh, immutably and be able to sort of regenerate them, view them, process them on demand. Um, so that's why you want to bundle them and that's why things like uh, if you're in Graham's uh, What's New in R4 discussion, there, you, you brought up the fact that you know, um, digital signatures and such on bundles is one area where we haven't quite tested things out as much as we want to. So I did mention that there's a session I think tomorrow on that. So. I'll be attending that, and uh, I think I encourage other, others to as well. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, FHIR documents, once you bundle them up, they have the same basic obligations as a CDA document. Like I said, they need to be persisted, uh, they can be you know, signed, all that type of stuff. The full rules on FHIR documents, again, if you want, in the current build, they're here. If you want to see what was in, you know, was published in uh, R3, you can just change that to hl7.org slash uh, FHIR and, and get that there as well. So as FHIR developers, uh, why might you be interested in clinical documents? 
Um, uh, one big use case that I see is an easy path uh, to get massive amounts of existing data. I mean, there's millions of CDA documents that are flying around uh, uh, right now, um, you know, especially in the US, but, but around other countries as well. Um, <clears throat> most EHR, uh, EHRs can export CDA documents. And if you, um, and actually many of their CDA export capabilities are a lot more stable than their fire APIs. Um, if you could do CDA to fire conversion, guess what? You've got a, a very easy way to, you know, extract a lot of information out of EHRs and load your fire servers with them and do some processing. Also, um, one use case that I've been finding recently is a lot of uh, developers who need to exchange clinical documents and maybe need to comply with existing regulations, like producing CDA documents, they don't want to learn CDA. It's, it's old school XML and use HL7 version, version 3 data. It's just ugly. Um, they want to use Fire, but Fire's not written into regulations yet. So what I've been teaching them is, well, create Fire documents and then, you know, have someone on your team or, you know, uh, um, you know contract with someone to develop Fire to CDA conversions for them. And what you end up with is actually CDA documents that are a lot more consistent um, than, than usual. You get a, a, a framework for creating documents that's a lot easier to teach developers. And uh, all around, basically, just uh, use Fire as an API for creating CDA documents. Um, but the most important one, I think, is just prepare for when Fire documents are the norm. Uh, and I think that day is coming soon. So, um, uh, diving a little bit more into some details on Fire documents. Again, I mentioned before they're bundles of resources. And basically, it looks kind of like this you've got a, a bundle resource with a series of entries in it. The first one is always going to be the composition resource. And then uh, inside of there, you can have uh, uh, basically any number of other resources, but you're almost always going to have a patient, uh, practitioner, things like that as well. Um, and uh, basically, the resources just reference each other by their uh, URLs. And I'll show how that referencing mechanism works later for folks who aren't familiar with bundles and, and how referencing inside bundles works. Um, but uh, let's go into the composition resource a little bit. So the composition resource, again, contains information about the patient, the author, the custodian, the type of document. And you can think of this as sufficient for medical records management, for document management, uh, for, for being able to look up documents quickly. So you know, you know, uh, the composition resource has a lot of search parameters. So you can search based on patient. You can search based on the link code or the document type of it. You can search by all, all sorts of things to quickly find the documents you're looking for. Now, if you think about a clinician user interface, if they're trying to find documents, some queries they often ask for is, you know, I want to see um, uh, John Doe's latest history and physical. Uh, that's very easy with the, with the search uh, APIs and Fire and, and what's available on Composition to pull up that very quickly. So it's, it's a very powerful mechanism. So a little more detail on Composition. Some of the key fields in here are, uh, first of all, the identifier. So every document um, uh, should have an ID that uh, um, says, you know, basically is, is a, in this case, this is a version independent identifier that uh, you can use to locate uh, the composition resource. Uh, <clears throat> next would be a date. So this is the date that the document was created. The type is typically a link code, which will say what kind of document, like it's a history and physical or a uh, uh, care plan or, or a document or any of those types. The subject is a reference to the patient uh, resource or a group of patients. There are some documents that are about multiple patients, things like group, uh, group therapy notes and such. Um, <clears throat> next is the author, which will be uh, typically a practitioner resource, but could be a patient. There are patient author documents and things like that as well. The attester is the person who uh, is uh, signing the document. Uh, typically it's the same person as the author, but not necessarily. Uh, next is the custodian, which is the organization responsible for maintaining this document. And then uh, the other key uh, areas are, are sections and narrative. And I'll talk about those uh, in, in a little bit on the next slide. And then again, you can have references to any other resource in the Fire spec. Okay, so sections in, in Fire in the composition resource. Uh, basically, you could have a series of repeating sections. Um, uh, they can actually be nested, so sections can themselves contain other sections. And sections, you typically contain a title as well as a link code describing the kind of section. And then the narrative markup, which is XHTML, just like the narrative for any other FHIR resource. Um, it is OK for sections to consist of only human-readable text. So it's not required to put machine-processable resources uh, in, in there. 
but often it's very useful to do so. And most documents that you see exchanged would have that. So here's an example of what a section looks like. In this case, we're uh, describing the allergies and intolerance section. We've got a code there, which is the link code for allergies and adverse reactions. And then down in the uh, uh, narrative, we just got a simple uh, HTML uh, uh, list that just says penicillin hyphen hives. And if you were to render that, uh, you end up with um, something that looks like what's on the right there, where it says allergies and tolerance in bold in the title, and then penicillin hives as, as a bullet, bulleted list. Now, if you were to go the next step and add the code of data behind it, you would just put in that same section an entry with an allergy and tolerance resource. And then you've got the full ability to add in, uh, in for instance, the snowman code for allergy to penicillin, and then that, that reaction with the manifestation uh, containing the snowman code for hives. So that's basically how you represent that same data that's in the section in uh, coded uh, fashion. Next, uh, after you create that composition resource and any other resources like patient and practitioner and such, you need to bundle it up. Um, so when you create a, a bundle for a document, there is a special type. So there are several bundle types that are available on Fire. Um, one of them is type document. And when you have that, it's a special flag. It says this is now a document bundle, and it has then all the rules that apply to Fire documents. Um, one of the key fields on there is bundle identifier. So this is a version-dependent ID. Uh, um, every document should have its own unique ID once it's bundled up and uh, must be globally unique in order to satisfy that persistence requirement and be, uh, have it be transportable. So I usually recommend just using uh, GUIDs or UUIDs for that. Uh, the first resource in the, in the bundle is the composition resource. And then, then from that point, since documents must be standalone and again tend to outlive the servers that they're created on, the bundle should, um, some would say must, I would be one of those who says must, but others disagree, uh, should contain all the resources that are referenced from the composition. Uh, we and Graham have art, uh, some ongoing arguments about that. I'll win one day. Um, so once you create your bundle, basically you're going to have, again, a series of entries, and within there, you're going to have references between the uh, uh, various resources. Um, those references uh, will basically uh, be URLs that will point to the full URL in a bundle entry. Uh, now, I'm showing an example of a uh, UUID uh, here, since I'm just showing something that's server independent. Um, but this works just as well if you actually have server-specific URLs in here. Um, really no difference uh, for how this works. Um, so in this case, we've got a composition resource with a subject that is referencing this value here. Um, there's an entry later on in the document with a full URL with that same value. Okay. Now the only um, I, I did say there's no difference if you use uh, uh, regular URLs. Uh, there's one exception to that is you can actually use relative URLs. So you could, for instance, up here in the subject reference, just have patient slash one, um, and then down below the full URL would be example at org slash fire dot patient slash one. Um, but uh, again, because you know th there's rules for referencing relative URLs and bundles, you just have to read up on the uh, bundle uh, uh, documentation itself, and it tells how to resolve it. Uh, next, um, again, I, I mentioned one of the key characteristics of documents are that they're human readable. So um, whenever you uh, present, uh, you, you have a document, you should be able to bring it up and present it to a human for reading. When you do that, uh, FHIR prescribes a recommended order, which is that um, first you render the narrative of the uh, um, subject resource, you know, which is typically, again, a patient resource. That's followed by composition.txt. Uh, and then lastly, by this, the, the actual text of the various sections in the, in the uh, composition resource. Now, um, uh, Lloyd McKenzie and myself did work on a uh, fire rendering style sheet that will basically do this for you. Um, it is available in the XML tools download. Since it says XML tools, I think you can guess that it only works with XML uh, bundles, not JSON. So if you are uh, uh, trying to render JSON documents, this style sheet will not work. You'd actually have to ask a fire server to return an XML, and then you could render this. Um, but there are, you know, I'm sure, you know, plenty of smart folks here who could create a JSON uh, rendering application pretty easily. All right. Um, so I'm going to uh, drop out of presentation mode for a minute and just walk through a fire document bundle. So this is a very simple one that I just put together. 
um, uh, earlier today. Uh, so, so this case, we've got a, 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 a bundle resource, and I've given an identifier that contains a, a UUID. Note that the type of this is document here, and the first entry is this composition resource. And inside of here, I've got uh, some text. Now basically, if you remember the, the rules that I had on the previous uh, um, uh, slide, it said you're going to render the patient resource first, then composition.txt, okay? Um, and that composition text here is going to contain all the information from the composition resource um, uh, that you want rendered aside from the section. So typical things you put in here would be the author's uh, name, maybe their contact info, uh, um, uh, things like the date the document was created, maybe some encounter info or, or information about a, a service event that's associated with this document. Um, but basically it's up to you as a document creator to decide what's important and put that there. Okay, next we've got um, uh, the composition identifier. So I mentioned this is a version independent uh, ID. So if I were to version that composition resource, this ID would stay the same. But if I were generating a new document um, based on that updated one, I would expect a new uh, identifier on the bundle. Next we've got the type. In this case, I've just got a link code, which is for a provider unspecified progress note. <coughs> Um, and you can sort of see that here in the uh, uh, title as well. Generally, the title and the document type should not conflict. Uh, next is a reference to the uh, subject, uh, which in this case is a patient resource later in the document. Likewise, author is going to be a reference to a practitioner. And uh, in this case, the tester, the person signing, is the, the same practitioner. And I scroll down here, and I've just got a very simple section that, uh, again, sort of represents what I had on the screen before. Uh, um, basically a, an allergy section with a, a note that they're allergic to penicillin. Um, next we go into the entries in the bundle. And this first one here uh, after composition, uh, the order is important after that first one, by the way. Um, but uh, typically you'll see the patient resource there. And this is, you know, if folks have been through the, the patient track in a connectathon, this is all going to look very familiar. Um, it's all basic patient information. And then next I've got the practitioner as well. So again, this is a very short document. It's narrative only, just has a patient or practitioner resource, and really that's it. Um, and then you can take this, and again, I, I haven't done very fancy HTML in here, so it's going to look pretty ugly when I render it, but it's going to look something like this up on screen. If I just brought this up on a web browser, uh, I had that style sheet associated with it via that processing instruction at the top of the document, and this is how it renders. Uh, now you can get as fancy as you want with the HTML that you can create. You can make really beautiful looking documents, or you can have very ugly ones. Um, uh, that's really kind of up to you uh, and what you want to put together. So that's a simple uh, document. There are more complex ones. So here, here's a case of a, an actual CDA document, which I've run through a CDA to fire conversion, and then created a document. And this is basically a pharmacist care plan. And this one here has um, you know hun hundreds or, or dozens of entries. So for instance, I could go through here and find um, medication statements. Uh, let's see here. We've got a bunch of medication requests for prescriptions. Um, in here, uh, dispenses to show actual dispenses of medications. There's going to be uh, uh, conditions in here. So this is a document that actually contains a, uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, clinical information, a whole lot of coded data. Um, so you can run that full gamut. The previous one was just strictly narrative. This one, again, has uh, uh, tons of, of, of uh, uh, resources that were all generated out of a pharmacy management system in this case. Um, so we've got that full flexibility and you can start very simply. In fact, that's one thing I recommend if you're going to create clinical documents is maybe start with simple narrative documents, start exchanging them, get, get the composition resource down and, and, and get your narrative and get some basic exchange going and then start adding more and more resources as your use cases and um, uh, budgets allow. Because um, it can get very expensive very quickly if you're uh, trying to get fully coded documents right at the get-go. All right, um, so let me go back to the presentation here and just sort of wrap up. I think we're still reasonably on time. So uh, uh, most folks, I think, are fairly familiar with uh, uh, Fire APIs and such, so I don't really spend much time on this. Um, you already know how uh, uh, Fire uh, uh, RESTful URLs work. But again, you, you might think of, uh, instead of um, 
uh, patient here in this case. This could be composition resource, and you can get composition number one. Um, one of the key uh, 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 operations that you can use in FHIR regarding documents is the document operation. So you, you would use this on a composition resource. So if you've got an instance of a composition you've created and posted to a FHIR server, and maybe you've got references to a patient and, and a practitioner and other resources on that same server, you can actually call that document operation. And the FHIR server, if it supports it, will bundle that document up for you. So it'll actually traverse through, pull out the resources that are directly referenced from the composition, and create a bundle for you and return it back. Uh, so that saves you the step of creating bundles yourself. Um, uh, do be aware that the current way that that uh, operation works is the way Graham thinks it was, is the th thinks it should, so it gets the minimum number of resources and doesn't fully traverse all the references. So if you have a composition where, a, where you have a section that references a list of medication statement resources, it'll only bundle the list. It'll bundle what's directly referenced from composition and leave out the medication statements that are referenced from that list. So again, we've been working on some other modifications to the document operation to support pulling out more resources. And you know, hopefully what I'm looking for is the full transitive closure, follow, follow all the references and any references from them until you get everything that's required. Um, uh, so that's that's coming. So right now, if you want to get everything that's really referenced in a document, you may have to write your own code to, to, to do that bundling. Um, so uh, when you call that document operation, uh, op it can optionally store the, comp the, the, the document bundle for you at the bundle endpoint if you just pass in that persist equals true uh, option. Okay, and if you do that, the location header will come back with the, uh, the location for that um, uh, document. Uh, if you want to move documents between systems, uh, the easiest way is to just uh, uh, send them to the bundle or binary endpoint, typically using a, a post. Um, if you want to preserve the, those server-specific IDs, um, you can use put, but make sure that your you know, IDs are globally unique before you do that, because you don't want to overwrite documents. Um, that that will basically just applies to pretty much any resource. Yeah, question. Uh, can you also send this as a message? Um, uh, the, uh, it, you have, uh, can, can you use fire messaging to send documents? Um, I, I suppose you could wrap a document bundle in a message bundle. Um, can you make a message bundle containing a document bundle? But you need a copy? Yeah, I haven't tried doing that, but I, I don't think there's any rule that says you can't. Um, I don't necessarily know why you wouldn't just post it yourself, but I guess, you know. Well, uh, there are some use cases. Yeah, yeah the, the, right, I can, we, now that I think about it. The sender and the receiver, yep. and you don't have that in the composition, so right. you need the message sender. True, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a good thing to d discuss later on and maybe try out during some of the hands-on sessions later. Um, so one interesting use case for documents uh, uh, that I like, and I'll, I'll probably I'll demonstrate this a little bit in tomorrow's session on CCDR and Fire, um, is decomposing documents. So let's say you've got a document uh, like that um, pharmacist care plan that I converted from CDA. It's got a whole bunch of you know nice juicy coded resources in it, um, but as a document bundle, you can't really get at those. But what uh, you can do, some servers, Graham servers, uh, at least it did at one point. Um, supports, uh, supports posting a document bundle to the transaction endpoint, and when you do that, it'll actually break it up into its component resources. So now instead of one big bundle, I've got a separate composition, a bunch of condition resources, a bunch of medication statements, medication requests, and all that type of stuff. And now I can access them independently. So it's a great way of, of just sort of, again, loading up your, your fire server with the existing uh, content um, uh, nicely and easily. Now. Um, Again, not all fire servers support that. Uh, if you want to do this against Happy, you may have to convert that document bundle into a transaction bundle, and then it works. Yes? Yeah, just a quick question about that. Presumably, you're going to have to have, if you've got internal references in your bundle, you try and decompose it, it's going to go horribly wrong. You have to have globally unique IDs. Um, no, actually, uh, when, you, when you do that, it will uh, um, basically rewrite the references. Cool. Yeah. So, at least, at least the, again, Graham server did that, and Happy server uh, did that as well. When I, once I turned it into a transaction. <clears throat> now, what, what what that does break is if you happen to have digital signatures on any of those, you know, yeah, it's gonna get a little hairy. 
But again, you're breaking it apart anyway, so you don't care at that point. All right, um, so managing prior documents. So I, I, you know, I mentioned, and I've said it over and over again, that persistence requirement. Um, documents are meant to be stored, meant to be kept, and again, often outlive the service they're created on. Um, so you need to find somewhere to store them. Um, easiest way is on a fire server. You can put them at the bundle endpoint. There's also a binary endpoint where you can store uh, as well. Either one of those works. Um, other options include document management systems, clinical data repositories, um, plain old file systems work if you want. I don't necessarily recommend that. Um, but again, when you're creating documents, especially ones that are tested, think about how you're going to manage them and store them. Again, I just recommend using a fire server, simplest way, and actually gives you the, you know, probably one of the most uh, powerful, powerful ways of doing this if you're working with fire already. Um, but again, documents, especially tested ones, should not be generated, transmitted, and then disposed of uh, like a transient message. For validating fire documents, you can do it just like any other uh, um, fire uh, fire resource. There's a you know fire validation pack if you want to use XML um, uh, 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 schemas and schematron files and such. Uh, the fire validator is a you know probably a better way. Again, that's a Java jar file that can run the full fire validation framework. Or you can just post a, a bundle to a fire server, and then you know uh, do, issue a get with a slash dollar sign validate, and it will validate it for you. Okay, um, I do recommend validating your documents and testing them against fire servers uh, versus just sort of setting them out blindly, because you'll you'll find uh, pretty quickly that um, fledgling attempts at creating documents often have lots of broken resources and bundles or broken references, and um, uh, so do do validate. Uh, and I think that's basically about it. Um, I think uh, resources, you know, everyone knows where the fire spec in the current build is. Um, if you do want to take a look at that position statement paper, uh, it is available at uh, landsandergroup.com slash resources slash publications. Uh, we are working on an update with it as we're getting towards uh, R4 of fire, so do expect to see an update on that uh, probably early next year, if not by the end of this year. And then, um, you know, me also, my email is, is there. I'm, I've did it continuously, rebooted occasionally, usually at happy hour. So, any uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, a few questions. So, um, did you, I, I may have missed it, um, you said there was a transform directive that you were including for rendering the fire composition oh. bundle as a... Yeah, so, so this is, um, oops, I think I clicked on the wrong, no, I don't want to bring up Slack, <coughs> thank you very much. Let me go back to uh, this document, the very top. This is just a, um, a, a basic XML processing instruction. So all, um, I won't say all web browsers, most web browsers, if they, they understand this and if they find the, um, the URL to here in the same directory or somewhere that's accessible, it will render the, the document for yeah. you. So um, <coughs> I'm putting on my CDA hat and yeah. remembering all the drama from you know maybe two, three years ago when there was a big discussion thread about the safety risks and the security risks, right. uh, uh, including an externally referenced style sheet. Yeah, yeah. You, you may not want to send them with this. I just did it so I can demonstrate it easily. Yeah, right. No, I understand. Yeah. I, was just, I, I was wondering if, if there had been any thought of putting actual formal language in the spec around composition bundles, saying specifically, you shall not do include. not do that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I certainly haven't started those discussions yet. Um, uh, it's one to sort of maybe talk with uh, um, uh, Graham, myself, and, and such. Uh, I don't know that we want to go that far and say you shall not for all cases globally. Um, we may want to say that in the U.S. or, you know, uh, again, it sort of depends on your use case, I guess. Fair enough. It's, it's, we've seen in the wild in that actual manifestation of a, of a patient safety issue as a result of a vendor changing their hosted transform file out from under basically changing the clinical meaning of the human yeah. represented version of it. Um, but the other question I had was um, you're talking about you know basically the, the analog to a level one versus a level three CDA of you know having yep. some some elements of some sections of your, your bundle not having any structured data and just having narrative. Um, and I noticed in your example, one of the examples that you gave, you had a status of generated for but it was just narrative. Presumably, oh, did, did I uh, forgot to change that? Well, I, well, I didn't know. That was what I was going to ask. Is <laughs> Actually, yes. This... One, of, one of the challenges that we run into is, particularly with CDA, but I imagine we'd run into the same problems right. with this as well. Is you know we're trying to consume as much of the document as discrete data as we can, yeah. where we yeah, know the, that we're getting instruction. Additional. 
Yeah, because because when we know we're getting data that's also unstructured, we want to do NLP on it to try to extract more information, but we don't want to have duplicate data as a result of doing structured and that. So, exactly. So 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 again, uh, Fire does have flags to indicate whether the narrative generator or not. I just to hack this together literally right before okay. this session. So the, the, language, the language around those statuses kind of gives that guide. Yes, well. exactly. So if it says generated like it does at the top, so basically I'm asserting up at composition text that the values in here are generated and they're just pulled basically from the uh, uh, practitioner resource and the metadata that I felt was important from the composition resource. So I'm stating this one is generated and could be safely regenerated. Um, but the other one down below, I'm saying there's additional possibly human authored content, so you don't want to touch that. Okay. Uh, yes, question in the back, couple. Uh, I have a question related to that narrative. Um, the resource itself also has narrative, reference resource. Yep. How does it relate to the narrative that is inside the composition? Do you copy that over? Well, well ideally, when you're creating those sections, if, if, if you are doing a fully generated document, um, you know, again, you're, it's uh, kind of up to you how you create your section narrative, but um, the way I would recommend is, you know, sort of a bubble up approach. Mm -hmm. So if you've got narrative in your, uh, you know, resources that are yeah. inside your section, that you pull that up and somehow assemble those together. Um, if your document is fully generated, you can use something like, you know, Happy. There's that um, uh, narrative generation API that could do all that for you magically uh, anyway. Um, but really, it's up to you and your use case for, for how you do that. So it's the John and Robin's question, really. It looks like this is something to your, say your APR is fire compliant, you get a document out of it and you take it and you put it here. What I'm interested in is taking that fire document, passing it through our installation engine, not necessarily doing anything to it, and passing it out to another fire compliant system. So it's rendered in the other fire compliant system. We, we don't want to copy of it. Your use cases seem to indicate that that's not really what it's designed for because, like you say, you don't, we shouldn't use it as a transient message that we give to them to do what we want with. And, and well, no, no, all, all I'm saying is when you create a document, if it's signed, you need to persist it somewhere. You can do additional stuff to it, so you can break it up and, and go and do other things with it. That, no, no worries with that. But if something carries a clinician signature, you don't want to just throw it away. Someone needs to keep a copy of that because at some point, a lawyer will likely ask for it. So that's fine in our use case because we don't need to find document, we just put the original in our API. Right. Okay. Right. And I think uh, we're just about at time. Yes. All right. He's, he's nodding. So uh, thank you all. Again, I'll be in the hands on sessions later. And uh, I'll be doing a CCA on fire presentation tomorrow for folks who want to learn about the US Realm uh, implementation guide uh, for the CCA use case that we're going to work with. Thank you.